Check, check. Ah, here we are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in our 67-part series of music classes for the Fort Washington Collegiate Church Community Choir. Uh, for those of you in the choir, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who are just browsing through Facebook and uh, seeing this beautiful exposed brick, uh, and saying, who owns that wonderful uh, apartment with that beautiful exposed brick? Well, stick around, and you might learn something about music. Uh, so these classes are for everyone, but specifically for the uh, Fort Washington Community Choir, which meets on Tuesday, uh, usually Tuesday evenings. Um, it's a choir that's open to everyone, regardless of prior experience, and uh, it's a fabulous group of uh, about 50 people. Um, so thank you for joining us for this, uh, this musicianship class. We're going to start with a little warm-up, and then we're going to uh, do a little bit of sight singing. Today we are going to uh, launch whole hog, as they say, into key signatures, and we're going to learn a little bit about the circle of fifths, which uh, will be awesome. And then we're going to focus on rhythm. So we're going to go until about 4.30. Um, and then this evening at 7.30, we have a community choir happy hour. I've sent you all the Zoom link in your email, and hopefully you can join us for then. So first of all, let's warm up a little bit. Go ahead and get comfortable where you're seated. Go ahead and reach up nice and high. Or you can stand. You don't even have to look at me for this part. You can look... Focus on something 
out in the distance, out your window. You've been on Zoom calls all day, nonstop. Let your eyes focus on something farther than two feet away. Go ahead and stand up and reach down. Keep your knees soft and relaxed. Take a few deep breaths and feel your lower back, uh, the back of your rib cage expand. Feel that nice stretch in your lower back. Wiggle your arms around a little bit. Let your head hang and be soft. And let's take a deep breath and high yawn sigh here. And one more deep breath in, coming up nice and slowly out on a hiss. And as you come up, forgive me, I'm just going to open up window here, see how many people are watching. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and roll your shoulders backward. And roll your shoulders forward. Let's take our neck around gently clockwise. I think I'm getting a lot of noise from this shirt. No more shirt noise. Let's try something else. Hmm. One second, folks. Technical difficulties. Try that. Sorry. I, I can see that this mic is making a lot of sounds. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. That's probably better. Okay. Go ahead and take your head around gently clockwise. And back the other direction. <clears throat> and go ahead and let your head lean back and your jaw relax. Keep breathing. And go ahead and tilt your head all the way forward. And come up. Give your masseter muscle a little love. I'm going to turn down the compression on this microphone and see if that solves it. Just nice, quiet times here on Facebook with you guys and YouTube. And let's put our hands on the side of our rib cage. Feel the sides of your, uh, your ribs expand out to the side. Become aware of your shoulders. Keep your feet flat on the floor. Sitting up nice and tall. And let's breathe in for four, hold for four, out on a hiss for 24. Ready? And in, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, and out. Three, four, five, six. Twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. Let it all out. Same thing. Ready? And in, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, and out. 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Good. Let's take a deep breath and high yawn sigh. And one more. Hey, let's do a siren from an ah on the bottom of your range to an ooh in the top. Good. <clears throat> Let us warm up. Uh, let's do uh, one, three, two, four, three, five, four, two, one. Just on a hum. Here we go. And. Switch to NG. will love you for. Eyes open. Ah. Ah. Sliding up and down five notes, all the notes in between, nice sloppy gliss. Here we go. And to our head boys. I refrained from bourbon last night. I'm much better at that today. Here we go. Sneeo, Sneeo, 
Sneeo, soar over the top. Sneeo, 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 sneeo. Two more. Sneeo, last one. Sneeo. Go ahead and yawn it out. Um, and I am going to, oh, that is down. Awesome. So let us continue with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of ear training. So the, uh, the recap every time is going to get quicker and quicker, folks. So if you uh, have just joined us, uh, make sure that you go back and watch the previous videos there at fortwashingtonchurch.org slash choir. All three of them are, are in a row. So if you feel a little bit lost today, um, know that all the information is, uh, everything you need to know is in those first three videos. Let us uh, do a little bit of warm up on scale degrees. Remember that we're taking our, in this case, case, our major scale, and we're assigning scale degrees to it. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Back to one, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so let's just sing up and down the scale. Here we go, deep breath, sitting up nice and tall. I see you on the couch, sit up straight. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. One, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Let's do that again, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Let's go back to seven. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now we're going to sing every other note. So we're going to skip like this. One, three, two, four, three, five, four, six, five, seven, six, one, seven, two, one. And then back down. Okay, slowly. Here we go. And one, three, two, four, three, five, four, six, five, seven, six, one, seven, two, one, one, six, seven, five, six, four, five, three, four, two, three, one, two, seven, one. Okay, let's do that one more time. Here we go. One, three, two, four, three, five, four, six, five, seven, six, one, seven, two, one, one, six, seven, five, six, four, five, three, four, two, three, one, seven, two, one. It's a nice way to practice. If you do that every day, for a minute or two, you'll get better at it. Uh, let's sing a couple patterns. So we're going to sing one three five three one, one four six four one, one three five three one. Okay. So here's one, and I want you to uh, imagine where three is. So see if you can hear three in your mind. Remember that this kind of ear training is not really about our voice at this point. It's about tuning your inner piano, uh, being able to focus uh, your, your executive function on that pitch. So it's, it's finding home, finding where one is, and then walking up in your mind to three until you can really recognize that relationship. So you're, you're hearing one, and now we want to hear three in our mind. One. Can you hear three? Sing three. OK. So now we're at three, three. Now we want to go to five. So now imagine here's three, and we're going to walk up to five. So three, five. So we're walking up three, four, five. So now we're going from five. Let's sing three, three, and back to one. So let's sing one, three, five, three, one. One, three, five, three, one. Let's sing one, five, one. One, five, one. Now, how are we going to find four? Well, we can walk up from one. One, mm -hmm. 
four. We can also just walk one. Now that we have a better sense of where five is, we can just walk down one step from five. So if I know where this is one and this is five, and I can just go from five to four. So one, four. So now we're gonna sing one, four, six, four, one. So one, four. Now where's six? Can you sing six? Sing six. Six. Okay, so here's four. Four. So again, uh, as I always say, uh, you never guess where it is. If it's uncomfortable, you say, oh, I'm totally disoriented. Chris, this is totally disorienting. I don't know what the, how to sing the numbers. I don't know where I am. That's fine. As long as we know where home is, okay, or we know where we are at the moment, we're at four, and we don't know where six is, we simply just walk up by step. Four, five, six. Okay, so four, six. Sing that back, four, six. Four, six, four, one. Four, one. Now, do you remember where one, three, five, three, one is? Let's sing that. One, three, five, three, one. One, three, five, three, one. One, four, six, four, one. One, four, six, four, one. Now, can we go down to seven below where we are and do seven, two, five, two, seven? So here's one, where seven, seven is down here. Seven, then to two, seven, one, two, seven, two. Sing that with me. Seven, two. Do you remember where five is? Five, two, seven. So let's sing that back. Seven, two, five, two, seven. Seven, two, five, two, seven. Back to one, three, five, three, one. One, three, five, three, one. So we're gonna do that whole sequence together. Okay, and we're, we're spelling out uh, these nice chords. Right, and now you can play all the pop songs. Okay, so one, three, five, three, one, one, four, six, four, one, Seven, seven, two, five, two, seven, one, three, five, three, one. Here we go, slowly and one, three, five, three, one, one, four, six, one, four, six, four, one, seven, two, five, seven, two, five, two, seven, one, three, five, three, one. Let's do it all one more time and one, three, five, three, one. One, four, six, four, one. Seven, two, five, two, seven. One, three, five, three, one. Now, for those of you who have uh, trained a little bit in solfege, you say, where does solfege fit into all of this? Well, uh, the process that we're doing now with scale degrees is, is pre-solfege. So we would uh, then, uh, we can apply solfege to this if, if you like, uh, but solfege just becomes a substitute for the note names themselves. It becomes a more uh, graceful way to sing the note names. So for in the key of C, the notes we're literally singing would be do, mi, sol, mi, do, do, fa, la, fa, do, a, si, re, sol, re, si, do, mi, sol, mi, do, okay? However, if we change keys, it's the changing key sound. Let's say we're in the key of D now. Now, if we want to sing that same pattern, the scale degrees remain the same. One, three, five, three, one. One, four, six, four, one. Seven, two, five, two, seven. One, three, five, three, one. All right, so the relationship relative to the key is the same. However, if we were using solfege, the solfege changes. So it would be re, fa, la, fa, re, re, sol, si, sol, re, do, mi, la, mi, do, re, fa, la, fa, re. So you see that when we're using what's called uh, fixed do, where uh, basically C is always do, uh, uh, D is always re, I was going to say, me is always E, E is always me, F is always Fa, no matter what key you're in. Uh, basically, fixed Do becomes just another way of singing 
uh, of, of singing the, the absolute pitches, whereas scale degrees orients ourselves in the key that we're in. So let's do, um, let's do a little bit of a, a, another ear training exercise, and then we're gonna go, we're gonna go to the other desk, the other view, and we're gonna lurk on intervals and key signatures. Today is a momentous day, folks. So um, let's go back, just stay in good old C major here. So here's our one. So if this is one, I want you to hear six above this pitch. So take a moment now in your imagination, in your, in your mind, and try to find six. Two ways to do it. The slower way, completely legit way for now, is to simply walk up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Or the more I practice, the more I, I feel where five is on the inside. One, five, I always feel that, that uh, gravity. Okay, and so I can, uh, I can quickly get from five, five to six. So let's sing six against this pitch. Six. Now let's walk up to seven. Seven. And walk up to one. One. Now can you go down to three below? So here's one. So it's here three. Again, we can go down and we can walk up. One, two, three. Okay, so sing three against this pitch. Three. Sing four. Four. Sing five. Five. Sing two against this pitch. Two. And this is the interval of a second that we talked about last week. One, two. This is a second, and this is a major second. It has a major quality to it, right? Because it's a whole step as opposed to a half step, right? So this has a minor quality. This has a major quality, right? So just a little review from the uh, interval uh, discussion we were having last week, the one-way discussion of intervals. Um, so here's our home bass. Here's our C. Let's sing four. So if this is one, see if you can find four. Four, here's four, now sing five. Five, now sing seven. Seven, and sing three. Three, sing two. Two, and sing one. One. So I hope that's helpful. Um, let us, um, I'm going to change camera views, and I have slightly upgraded my my uh, my gear because I have this amazing uh, graphic that I can show that doesn't make it look like. Sorry, you lost my audio there. I'm going to go to the standby screen while I change the camera. <laughs> And we're back. I'll just test the keyboard. Yay. OK. So we're going to continue with our discussion of intervals. And then we're going to work on key signatures uh, together. Um, because the key to all of this, no pun intended, is understanding where home is. And uh, to be able to use this, center, this system of intervals uh, well, uh, you have to know where home is. 
So we're going to work a little bit on intervals, and then we're going to talk about key signatures. So last time, we talked about the interval of a second and a major third. So again, the scale is divided up into 12 equal parts, right? And then we're back to the octave, right? Uh, there's, there's two number systems that are a little competing, so if you're uh, uh, slightly uh, uh, confused with this, it's okay. There's a reason they call it music theory, because it's not uh, necessarily almost always the most um, um, consistent. So we can talk about... We can talk about the pitches what's called diatonically, which is the seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pitches that make up in this case, our major scale. Uh, but we can, and so we can measure the distance diatonically. So we can say, this is a third, one, two, three. This is a fourth, one, two, three, four. Fifth, sixth, seventh, octave, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth. Haha, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But uh, it can go that high when we're talking about intervals. So we can measure the distance diatonically. Um, we can also, I'm going to write that word down, diatonic. And again, there's our reference. Uh, uh, if someone knows where the word diatonic comes from, let me know in the comments because I didn't bother to look it up today. Uh, but it is not when you're in week five of your self-imposed quarantine and you decide that your, uh, your gin needs a healthier alternative. That is not diatonic. Uh, diatonic is talking about the relationship of the scales within uh, a major or minor uh, or, or modal um, uh, system. So you can talk about uh, these intervals diatonically. One, two, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, right? And I can measure from any note. So here, second, third, fourth, fifth. But we can also, uh, we can also measure these relationships chromatically. So when we're talking about the relationships between the complete set of 12 notes, we're talking about, uh, we, we have a different numbering system. So uh, if I'm in the key of C major, this is a third. But if I'm in the key of C minor, This is also a third. So if I came up to you and I said, Jim, play a third above C, you would go, well, that is a, seems like a fair question, Chris, except what third do you want? I could play this third, or I could play this third. They're both thirds. So you need to be more specific, Chris. And I would say, Jim, you're right. Uh, I do need to be more specific. Um, so in that case, we are talking about, as we mentioned last week, what is the quality of this third? Is it a major third or is it a minor third? You say, that, I hear it, but I'm a kind of scientific guy, Chris. Jim is very scientific and he wants to know, how exactly do you measure a major third versus a minor third? You say, ah, okay, now we're talking about uh, uh, counting the number of half steps. Right? Counting every little half step, not just counting the, the notes within the diatonic relationship, right? in this case, the major scale, but we're actually counting the number of half steps. So scientifically, if I want to think about it this way, uh, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four. So um, a major third uh, is four half steps away, right? Where a minor third is three half steps away from, uh, from C, okay? So, uh, so the, the, the half step relationship matters, but you're gonna hear uh, when we talk about uh, um, uh, the diatonic relationship, I don't want you to confuse the, the systems of numbers. Um, uh, as opposed to this is seven, but this is also a kind of seven. So we need to qualify. Uh, we need to qualify what kind of seventh that is, or what kind of fifth this is. 
for example. Okay, so let's see. Um, let's, stay, let's stay in the key of C major for a second. So we've learned about um, major and minor. I'm going to lower this camera a little bit. Zoom in on the piano. So we've learned about uh, major and minor thirds and seconds, right? Last week, major seconds have a half step in between, right? This is a whole step, this is a half step. Major second consists of a half step relationship, minor second, half step, directly adjacent. So again, this would be what interval? Well, we start to learn orally that it sounds, it sounds a little brighter, it sounds a little more consonant than this. It's a little more grating sound. So we can start to hear, ah, that's a half step. You say, God, Chris, why would anybody ever use half steps? Well, half steps in the right context can be quite beautiful. You know, especially if you have this kind of dissonance that resolves. For example. Um, so half steps are not all bad. Minor half steps, that is. Um, and then we talked about major third versus minor third. So actually, let's play a little game here for a second. I'm going to play some thirds, and I want you to guess if they are major thirds or minor thirds. Okay, so just listen and see if you can figure it out. And I'm going to, I'm going to cover your eyes. Here we go. Look at that. This is high tech, folks. So. What do you think? Major third or minor third? Aha. This sounds a lot more like a minor third. You hear the brightness? You hear how it has a little bit more of a, uh, uh, perhaps a, a, a happy quality? It sounds oversimplified, but really any, any, any way of talking about music in this, in this way is, 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 is rather simplified. Um, so it, it works. Major third or minor third? Aha, so when you, see the, when, you, when you hear the minor third, it's immediately clear that this is, is in fact the major third. Okay, uh, let's do a couple more. So the first one was a minor third, the second one was a major third. Okay, so now let's talk about fourths. So I'm going to measure diatonically, one, two, three, four, all right, four notes away. And the fourth has this very kind of noble, kind of open sound. All right, and you often hear uh, a little bit of a cliche if you're trying to find a fourth. It's the, it's the opening tune of Here Comes the Bride. Okay, so that's a fourth. Now, this is what's called uh, a perfect fourth. I'm gonna write this down for us on the paper for now on the bottom so you can see it. You can just write it as P4, okay? So what happens, so in our, in, our, in, our, in our major third, we could lower it to become a minor third. What happens if we lower our fourth? Well, it starts looking like a major third. Are there theoretical ways in which we describe this as a fourth that's been lowered? Maybe. But for all intents and purposes, if you're walking down the street and you hear this interval, you're going to think it's a third. Now, what happens if we raise our fourth by a half step? Well, this interval is really special. Let's count the half steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. So six half steps away, a raised fourth has a lot of different names. We could call it an augmented fourth, right? We're not going to call it a major fourth. 
This major has a certain, um, perhaps, emotional baggage that we, uh, good baggage, emotional resonance. So this does not sound, this does not have the same emotional resonance as, uh, as a major triad. So we don't call it a major fourth. Uh, we actually call it an augmented fourth. We've taken that fourth and we've made it just a little larger. All right, so it's called an augmented fourth. And you might uh, augmented fourth. These are just my scribblings. We'll, we'll, we'll make them a little more formal later. Okay, so augmented fourth. Now let's go to the next interval up. So this is a fifth, and guess what? We also call it a perfect fifth. Now, uh, what happens if I take that perfect fifth and I lower it? Oh, well, I get the same interval. So uh, I've made this fifth smaller. You say, well, that's the augmented fourth. Yes, but let's just say for the sake of the story that in the story, the character uh, has not augmented, but rather diminished. So this fifth in the story has actually gotten smaller. So we're gonna call this a diminished fifth. So, so far we've learned perfect fourth, augmented fourth, diminished fifth. Now, we could take our, uh, we could take our fifth and we could also raise it we could have an augmented fifth, or sometimes uh, jazz musicians will call it a sharp five, uh, an augmented fifth, okay? Um, but as we'll see, all of these intervals have multiple names, depending on the context that they're in. So uh, sometimes when, when, uh, when Jim is out with his friends, he just goes by Jim. But when he goes home and he hangs out with his family, he goes by his formal name, Jimothy. So, it depends on the context that this interval is in. Okay, now let's take a look at something really quick. So, this interval is a fifth, this interval is a fourth. So what happens if I take this G here, and I actually just move it down an octave? Now, let's say that collection of notes, a G and C, sounds the same, right? So, is this interval also a fifth? Surely not. So let's look. One, two, three, four. So, uh, here, when we've taken this interval and we've inverted it, we've taken the G and we've put it down here, or conversely, we take the C and put it up here, the interval, one, two, three, four, the fifth becomes a fourth. Okay? Same thing if we take our fourth, let's take our C up here, and we invert it, we move the C up an octave, suddenly the fourth becomes a fifth. So these intervals of a fourth and a fifth are closely, are closely related. And you can hear that if I play, if I play these fourths like this, it has the same kind of open quality as if I play, They feel, they, they, they feel like a similar color. They're on the same part of the color, the color wheel. Um, so let's keep going up. So we have a one, two, three, four, five, a sixth. Okay, and we can, uh, we can lower this. Now, when we talk about a sixth, you say, well, is this now a diminished sixth and an augmented sixth? Aha, that is a great question. I'm so glad you asked. Let's take a look at this again. So we just went through this process where we inverted uh, the interval to create, to take a fourth and turn it into a fifth, right? So now let's first do that to the sixth. We take the sixth and we invert it. And now what is that sixth invert to? A third, right? So, and if I do the same thing as let's say I lower it, and I take it down here. I also have a third. So, exactly what I was saying earlier about the, uh, why do we not call this uh, interval a major fourth? Has to do with the uh, 
uh, perhaps the emotional resonance that that interval has, that we don't associate this sound with major. Um, however, the sixth, as you can see, it's a very close relative to the third. We are going to talk about the sixth in terms of major and minor. So in this case, this is actually a major sixth, okay? But when I lower it a half step, it becomes a minor sixth. And you can hear if I'm in the, let's say I'm in the key of C major, it has a very, you can hear that that sixth kind of wants to resolve down to five, for example. Whereas this, again, has a little bit more of an open quality, a brighter quality. Now something that's really fantastic, and this might be a little bit quick to introduce this, but um, uh, for those of you who've had a little bit of music theory before, you'll appreciate this. So notice what happens uh, when I take the major sixth and I invert it to a third. Is this a major third or a minor third? One, two, three. So we've only got these two half steps in between. A major third would be this, would be A and C sharp. So this next important principle is that a major sixth is inverts to a minor third, right? Here's our major sixth. If I take that C down, or that A, it inverts to a minor third. Uh, conversely, let's take our minor sixth. Okay, one, six, and I'm gonna take my A flat, I'm gonna move it down here. You can hear, ah, there are three half steps in between, right? One, two, three, four, right? Um, so that minor sixth inverts to a major third. Pretty cool. Uh, lastly, let's talk about the seventh. So we might call this, uh, I'm gonna go quickly through the seventh because seventh is pretty complicated, but uh, we can call this, um, uh, well, we didn't talk about this interval here. You could say, is this an augmented sixth? It could be, but usually uh, in, our, in most of our music, this interval is gonna have a certain function. It's gonna have a certain job. And so when we hear this interval together, uh, it's actually uh, often referred to as a dominant seventh, which we'll talk about uh, another day, uh, a couple weeks from now. Uh, this interval is usually called a, a dominant seventh or maybe a minor seventh, um, major seventh. So minor seventh, major seventh. Notice that major seventh inverts to a minor second. A major seventh, I'm sorry, a minor seventh inverts to a major second. So what's considered major here inverts to a minor interval here. Say, this is crazy. That's right, it is all crazy. And the reason is not because monks are lazy. The reason is because uh, music is complicated and it's all theory and somebody just made this stuff up and there's really no rhyme or reason to all of it. Um, but it's interesting enough that you should know. Okay, so we talked about intervals and now my friends, the moment we've all been waiting for is key signatures. So, <clears throat> We spoke last week, and we'll continue to do more work with intervals, uh, because now the, now the next step is, is singing and recognizing these intervals. Actually, I want to do more of that for a second. I'm changing my mind. Change my mind for a second. So I want to just show you where we're going with this. So uh, we, learned, we, we, we did an exercise where we picked out major thirds, right? And we picked out minor thirds. We're going to start to do that soon with all of the intervals. So take a listen to a few intervals and see if you can guess what they are. So it is a third, fourth, second, fifth, sixth, seventh, 
And what is the quality? Is it major, minor, diminished, augmented? Or he said this little tune, right, kind of sounds like here, come, here Comes the Bride. Ah, so it's actually a perfect fourth. Um, let's see. This is a tricky one. But this interval, this minor seventh, or sometimes what we're gonna call a dominant seventh, also has a nice song reference uh, from West Side Story. There's a place for us. All right, so though. So this interval, that's an easy way to remember the minor seventh. And if I do it in another key, um, right, there's your minor seventh again. Right, here's another one. Uh, right. Sing that. One seven, one seven. Now, let's raise that to a major seven. So here's our minor seven. Let's raise it to a major seven. So sing one major seven. One seven. Sing minor seven. One seven. Okay. Let's do that again with uh, another seventh. So, so let's do this. Let's do another uh, exercise for a second. Let's say I want to find a major seventh above this note. Gee, that seems like a leap, right? How do I begin to find it? Well, what does a major seventh invert to? It inverts to a minor second below. So if I can hear from this note, if I'm on one here and I go down to seven, and then I just jump up in an octave, one, seven, right? You might not pull this note out of your butt initially, but however, you can walk down to the, the inversion of the interval, and that can help you find, uh, that can help you find the larger interval. So, so one going down to seven, and then I just sing up here, seven, so I'm going to sing one seven. Everybody sing that back with me. And one seven, one seven. Now let's take that major seventh and let's make it a minor seven. So I'm just going to walk down a, a half step. Seven down to minor seven. So now sing one, one minor seven. Right, and there's our Bernstein again. Okay, um, ah, I neglected to give you one really fun bit of information, and then we'll move on to key signatures. So remember our augmented fourth? And if we saw this uh, and we didn't, we just heard it, we didn't know uh, if this was an F sharp or a G flat, you wouldn't know whether to call it an augmented fourth or a diminished fifth. If you just heard that interval, you wouldn't know. You could guess, you could say, oh yeah, that's, a, that's clearly an augmented fourth. And someone would say, no, 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 it's clearly a diminished fifth. I don't know what you're hearing, right? Uh, how it's printed would determine what you call it. However, this is a very special interval. Um, this is also called uh, the tritone. Shout out to the tritone, hooray. And the tritone is a really important interval. Uh, but in early music, especially Baroque music, oh no, my camera just went off. Hang on a second. It's going into, I wasn't giving it any love, and it shut off on me. Come on, camera. Here we go. We're back. It doesn't like to just sit here and not record. Um, this interval, uh, in early music, was often referred to as the devil in music. One of the most sort of dissonant and heinous sounding, sounding intervals. So these are all tritones, or these are all uh, augmented fourths, diminished fifths. And so, you know, uh, if someone wants to write something scary, they might use that tritone interval. It's 
It's not very pretty, but it's effective. It's the devil. Um, so we learned about perfect fourths, augmented fourths, diminished fifths, augmented fifths, sixth, major and minor sixth, major and minor seventh, and the tritone. That's a lot for one day. So you might even go back and rewatch this in future days as we continue to work on these things together. Now, uh, we started talking about key signatures in prior weeks. So when we look at a piece of music, we have the grand staff. We have our little bracket that tells us that these clefs are connected. We have our treble clef, which circles around the G line. We have our bass clef, which circles around, or the dots encompass the F line, right? And as I love to say, this looks like a fancy G. This looks like a fancy F to help us keep track of these things. So when we first look at a piece of music, we first look at the clef, say, what clef am I in? Uh, then the next thing we look at is the key signature. And that's going to tell us what arrangement of uh, uh, sharps and flats, as you might colloquially say, what black notes are we going to use? Uh, are we always going to have a B flat in our song? Or, for example, are we always going to have an F sharp? And this is kind of a, uh, it's a little bit of a code to crack at first because um, this is almost like uh, giving somebody directions based on the, the adjacent house. Uh, you know, saying go to the, go to the pink house, uh, go two doors down from the pink house. It's not really giving you the exact address. Where is home? Uh, how, do I, how do I know where home is based on this information? We kind of have to infer. It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit of a puzzle at first. Um, so we look at this, for example, if I write an F sharp in my key signature, is the key signature F sharp? Uh, uh, surely not. The monks couldn't make it that easy. Okay. So what's happening is when we have, for example, sharped our F, here's our F, and we've raised it a half step, we've made it sharp, that's telling us something about the collection of pitches that this piece is going to use. So it's going to use all these white notes, and it's going to use this F. And so if I play around with this collection, I don't have to start anywhere in particular. I start to rest in, oh, hey. This collection of pitches that uses F sharp really leads me home to G. G really feels like the resting place. It feels like one. G is one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay? So in this case, F sharp has actually, uh, is actually the seventh degree of the scale, okay? Y'all, this is going to start coming together. You're saying, Chris, why are you teaching us all this esoteric stuff? Why are you going this through all these intervals and all these categories? Because it all comes together. Kids, it all comes together, all right? So uh, stay with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Okay, so I've, I've taken this, this F and I've raised it. And this F here happens to be the seventh degree of the scale in G. Yes, yeah, so I've raised it. Hooray, and now I'm in the key of G major. So all that is to say is that I've cracked the code. When I see the key signature that has F sharp, I know that I'm in the key of G. Now, some of you who've studied this a little bit say, well, Chris, this could also be E minor. Yes, that is true. Each major key has a relative minor key. Uh, just like how we inverted intervals earlier and a major sixth becomes a minor third, for example, a major key, for our purposes, inverts to a minor key. 
So we can talk about that more at another time, but uh, know that uh, this usually implies something like G major, but G major has a relative minor that, that could invert. So it could invert two. So depending on uh, the, uh, the song, depending on how I use this key, I could also start here on E. Ah, in this case, E minor really feels like home. Yeah, it might be it's kind of a sad home. Okay, so the context of the song that we're working on is going to matter when it comes to really determining on what key we're in. Again, this is not a this is not um, uh, a quantitative. You can't you can't ascertain this stuff from a quantitative analysis. It's theory. Um, it's 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 how our brains interpret this information, and it's going to be a little different. Uh, there are cases where someone's going to hear something as being in a minor key, perhaps, and someone's going to hear something as being in a major key. But I digress. So, this is the key of uh, of G major. So let's do another key. Now I'm going to lead you through this uh, rather uh, systematically, and it's not going to make sense at first, but it shortly will make sense. So I'm going to write an additional sharp. Now I've chosen this sharp for a reason. We have F sharp and we have C sharp, F and C sharp in my key signature. So let's go back to the keyboard and let's be Socratic about it for a second. Let's just play, play around and see if we can figure out what, what key could we possibly be in. So we have our F sharp and we have our C sharp. So let's see. Well, we're out of G, okay. That doesn't really sound, okay, I don't think we're in A. Actually, that sounds pretty good. What is that? Okay, I guess we could be in maybe we're in B minor, but let's find our let's find our major key. That sounds really cool, but that's not a major that's not a major scale. Ah, interesting. Okay, this this uh, this D feels like home, doesn't it? One two three four five six seven one seven six five four three two one. Okay, so. Uh, what's happened? We've maintained our F sharp, right? F that was now the seventh degree in the scale in G has become the third degree, one, two, three, the third degree of the scale in D. Now what about the C sharp? Uh, huh. The C sharp, again, is uh, the, the thing that we have raised to get to this point is scale degree seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Huh, okay, we're gonna come back to that. Let's do another key. And again, there's a method. There's a method and a pattern to this which you will soon see. So we have an F sharp, G sh I'm sorry, C sharp, Let's add a G sharp. F, C, and G sharp. F, C, and G sharp. So we said this is D. What could this be? Brump. Back to the piano. Okay, so we've added this G sharp. We have an F sharp. Keyboard slip, or my camera slipping. G sharp, F sharp, and C sharp. Everything else is white notes. Ah, again, that sounds cool. Now you might say, Chris, how do you know? How do you know that you're you're using this note, but you're not using this note? How do you know it's not? Or how do you know? Because this is where it comes back to the diatonic relationship, where we're only using 
one of each letter. We've only altered, we've only altered, the, uh, we've altered the C, and therefore this C is no good in this key. We've altered the F, therefore this, this F is not in play. We've altered the G, this G is not in play. So everything else is gonna be white notes. And it turns out, we're in the key of A. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay? So, again, can you guess what, without even hearing it, this G sharp, what's its relationship to A? What scale degree is the, is the G sharp that we've added? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, so we were in the key of D, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, right? And we've taken our G and we've raised it a half step, made it a G sharp, and now we're in the key of A. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Okay? So, I have picked keys for us, not, not, not altogether haphazardly. And I've added one sharp at a time. Now, the question is, what is the relationship between these notes? Well, let's go back to the piano. So we can see it on the piano. G. Let's say we've got a D. And we've got an A. Okay, so, well that interval is a fifth, and I, well, A, hmm, I've gone down a fourth here, I run up a major second, I don't know, this is confusing, aha, but what if I take my A and I put it above? So now, I've gone from G up a fifth, one, two, three, four, five, to D. And then I've gone up a fifth to A. One, two, three, four, five, okay? To A, so, and if I go, uh, if I go back to where I had no sharps in the key signature, if I go down from G, we actually started at C with, with no sharps or flats in the key signature. So we've gone from the key of C, We've gone up a fifth, and we've raised scale degree seven to G major. Then we've gone up a fifth, and we've raised scale degree seven, and we're in the key of D major. We've gone up a fifth to the key of A, we've raised scale degree seven, G sharp, and we're in the key of A. Okay, class, so what happens next? Where's my next key? Five, now I'm in the key of E, and I'm gonna jump it down here so you can see. All right, so now we're in the key of E. I'm gonna raise scale degree seven, D sharp, so now I have an F sharp, G sharp, A, B, C sharp, add my D sharp. Okay? I can keep going. I can go up a fifth to B and do the same thing. I've raised the A now to an A sharp. Okay, I can keep going. I'm gonna go up a, a perfect fifth. See, now this matters because if I just go up here, what interval is this? Is this interval the same as this interval? Hear this nice, strong, open fifth? This perfect fifth? Nothing in the world is wrong with it, it's perfect. Whereas this, this is the devil, so we don't have we need to count chromatically. We just can't count diatonically. Aha, so this is where it all comes together, right? One, two, three, four, five. It's the same number of half steps in between to get this perfect fifth. So now my next key, which is going to have, let's see, so B or E was four sharps, B is five sharps, F is gonna, F sharp is gonna have six sharps. I'm gonna go down here so you can see. 
right? F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, B, C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, holy mackerel, F sharp. And again, we would call this E sharp and not F because we already have an F. We already have F sharp. So we're not going to have an F sharp and an F in the same, uh, in the same house, okay? We're going to raise this E, okay? Because we have a D sharp, uh, but we haven't used E yet. So we're going to raise that E to an E sharp. And again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've raised the seven, one. So if I want to go back, if I want to go back down a fifth to B, I just lower the seventh to, to this. And here I am at the key of B. Okay, so what we have just completed, my friends, bum, 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 is called the circle of fifths. Okay, and in this case, we have gone up the circle of fifths. All right, next time, we will go down the circle of fifths. So, we've only used sharps so far, and you might have a question about how did I know which sharps to add? Well, remember that we're always, uh, when we go up a fifth, we're always raising the seventh degree of the scale. Right, so if we go up a fifth from C and we go to G, it's the seventh degree of the scale that adds on the new sharp. Okay, so now let's say we want to go down a fifth. We're actually going down a fifth to F. Now, to get the key of F major, I've actually lowered, uh, lowered this B to B flat. Now, what is B's relationship to C, the key I was just previously in? Ah, it's the seventh. I've lowered the seventh of the previous key, right? So same idea. So now let's say I want to go down another fifth. Uh, and again, we're going to go to a perfect fifth, not the devil. The perfect fifth, okay? And let's say I want to play in the key of B flat. I'm going to lower what was the seventh of my previous key, right? F, down to an E flat. So now I have two flats. So when we go down the circle of fifths, we add flats. That's one way of thinking about key signatures, and it's, uh, it's super cool. So if this seems like a lot, it's because it is. Uh, it's a lot, especially if this is new. Those of you who've had a little bit of um, music training uh, in, in your life at some point, some of this might ring a bell, um, but um, I hope in any case there's something new to be grasped uh, from some of it. So when you go up the circle of fifths, you add sharps. When you go down, you add flats. Okay? Um, write down any questions that you have about this so we can work more on it next time. There's a ton more work to do, but I've been waiting to get us to this moment um, because this is the most important thing. So now, look at how we start to apply this. If you know where your home is, let's say you see, you're gonna start to soon, by memory, know what, what key this is. You're gonna see two sharps and you're gonna go, oh, that's the key of D. That means D is home. So when I see this piece that I've never read before, I go, how the heck am I gonna sight read this? I don't even need to play it on the piano because I know this is one, and I know that this is three, and I know we're, we're, we're uh, in D major, okay? One, three, six, five, two, seven, three, a six, seven, one. I've read it perfectly, I think. Let me know in the comments if I didn't. No, I'm just kidding. I read it perfectly, but it's because I knew where home was. I knew what the key signature meant, and so I knew that I could orient myself, I could orient these pitches to one, and knew this was three away, 
one, three, six, five, one, three, five, three, one. Okay, and I know this is one, two, two. I know this is two up here, two, seven. And again, I have a strong sense that seven resolves to one, so I know where seven is at all times. Two, seven, seven, two, five, two, seven. Okay, three, three, six. This is B, I know this is six, seven, one. Okay, but all of this works together once I understand what key I'm in, so that I can apply the sense of, uh, the sense of scale degrees and tonality to the key. So this is, this is where it all starts coming together, folks. And I, we're, we're, I know that I rushed a little bit through the Circle of Fifths talk because it's, a, it's something we'll need a lot of practice on. Um, but let me give you one more example, and I'll do it in bass clef for the basses. So let's say um, I see this key with three flats. So I know I'm going to go down the Circle of Fifths three times. So again, you're going you're gonna to memorize this stuff. You're going to know it. But let's see, I go down three times. So I've gone down once, added a flat, gone down another time, added two flats, three flats. I'm actually in the key of E flat. So three flats is E flat. Whoa. So. So here's my piece that I have to sight read or I have to practice. So I, all I need to know is that E flat is home based on this information. So this is one. And so I say, okay, well, I have found my E flat. Now let's go down one, seven, six. So this is six, six, one, two, seven, five, six, three, two, five, one. Okay. You see how this starts to come together and starts to get really, really helpful. We know where we are, we know where home is, and we apply the system of scale degrees. Okay, there's a little bit more to it, right? It takes a lot of practice to, you know, some of you are probably quite fast at this and have other ways of sight reading. You might say, oh, that's a, that's a sixth, that's a seventh, that's a fourth. That's helpful to know, but for most of the music that we see, it's much, much better if we understand uh, where we are in the key. Because if somebody just says to me, here's, here's the tonic, here's home, sing six. Six, six, five, seven, one. I know where I am. And I know that, that, that C, in this case, C's relationship to E flat is the sixth scale degree. So looking at this and getting this quickly is gonna take a lot of practice. Um, but it's practice that's worthwhile, and it's practice that's going to help us all become better sight readers, which is the goal, which is the goal of our, our COVID-19 rehearsal time online, is for us all to become better readers and better musicians. So we're going to take just a really quick three-minute break um, to stand, get a drink of water, and stretch, and we're going to come back, and we're going to do a little bit of rhythm practice for about 10, 15 minutes or so uh, before call, we call it a day. But write down your questions uh, and email them to me um, so that uh, we can work on some of this, uh, continue to work on some of this next week, and it can help guide uh, what I do. So I'm going to turn a little bit of the Chick Corea back on. We're listening to a, a really uh, fun song by Chick Corea called Morning Sprite, one of my favorite uh, from the, uh, the Chick Corea acoustic band. Uh, and we'll be, uh, we'll be right back with you. So stay tuned. We'll be back in three minutes.
All right, we are back. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so, we're gonna spend about 10, 15 minutes on rhythm. Hello, I'm still here physically. I'm not just a disembodied hand. <laughs> um, so, take out some blank paper and you can just use uh, a sheet of blank plain paper if you like. And we're going to work on rhythm. I'm not going to review anything this time. We're going to launch right into it. So uh, just like we have a system of scale degrees to help us to, uh, to sing pitches, there's a system of uh, talking about rhythms to help us uh, or there's a system to help us to speak rhythms and, and get things uh, accurate on the first try. So um, for right now, we're just going to set up a measure of 4-4. Four, four. That wasn't my straightest line. And I'm going to fill in my 4-4 four, four bar with four quarter notes. So we encounter that in our music. And we're going to think to ourselves, here's our beat, and we're going to count one, two, three, four. OK? Everybody just do that with me. Ready? And one, two, three, four. Let's take the same measure, and let's throw some rests in. OK? So now it's ready, and one, rest, three, rest. Right, so if we're performing this, we're performing this on the, on ta, it would be ready, and ta, rest, ta, rest. Right, one, two, three, four. Inside, we're still counting two and four. Okay, but we're performing the note that's on the beat. You say, yeah, 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 this is easy. Okay, yeah, okay, this is easy, all right. I, I grant you that. Now, let's say we encounter a rhythm. See guys, we go from zero to 60 really fast. Okay? You see that and you go, oh my god, all right, well that's a lot harder. It is not that much harder. But uh, we're gonna apply the same principles. So, now, remember, that uh, as, we are, uh, as we are counting, we first want to identify where are the main beats. So we know that two eighth notes equals a quarter note. So, okay, those two eighth notes line up very well. Where's our next downbeat? Well, we have, we have one beat here, an eighth rest, eighth note. Okay, that's our second beat. Eighth rest, eighth note, that's our third beat. On the rest, right? This is on the rest, this is on the rest. And then fourth beat, two eighth notes equals a quarter there, okay? So it actually, okay, not so bad. Uh, but I, gosh, where do these other notes go? So 
Counting at the quarter note level is not going to work. One, four. We need to go down, kids. We need to go down. Dive, dive, dive. We need to subdivide. We need to subdivide, okay? Dividing under. So we're dividing under the quarter note level. We're going down to, what's the next level down? Well, the eighth note level. Remember from last time, how do we do that? We speak the eighth notes as and. So if I had a whole measure, if I had a measure and I just wanted to gratuitously fill it with eighth notes, eight eighth notes in my four four bar, I would speak this one and two and three and four and. Okay, say it with me. Ready? And one and two and three and four and. Now the lag time in the video might be kind of lousy now that I think about it. So that might, so tapping, where I'm tapping might not be super great. So one and two and three and four and. Okay? So now when we go up to look uh, at this measure we're trying to figure out, we apply that eighth note subdivision to the measure. So, do I have a note on one? Yes, one and. Do I have a note on and? Yes, I have this guy here. Do I have a note on two? No, I have a rest. Okay, but I'm gonna feel where B2 is. But I do have a note on the and of two. Ah, so here's a saying that you'll hear people say a lot. Uh, musicians will say, that note is on the and of two. Okay, so there's two and. So if I'm counting in eighth notes, I'm counting at the eighth note subdivision level. Okay, one and two and. So if you say sing ta on the end of two, one and two, ta. Right? I'm saying ta on the end of two. Is there a note on beat three? Well, there's a rest on beat three. There's a note on the and of three. And there's a note on beat four and a note on the and of four. So if I'm just speaking, again, just speaking the, the, the eighth note subdivision one and two and three and four and. Now I'm just going to perform the notes where they're written. So ta, ta, rest, ta, rest, ta, ta, ta. One and, 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 four and. So I'm not going to speak the rest. Let's do that again. One and, 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 four and. So I'm thinking the rest inside. One and rest, and rest, and four and. Ta, 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 ta. Okay, say it back with me. Ready, and ta, 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 ta. Let's do one more at the eighth note level. Okay, so here's my measure. Let's keep putting the key signature, or time signature there. So I don't have a note on beat one. I have an eighth note. So I, I'm going to subdivide one and. Do I have a note on beat two? Yes. Is there anything at the end of two? No, because this quarter note takes up two eighth notes, right? The math, this is where all that boring math that we did the other day is important, right? To help you to feel where this is. Three and, four and, right? So one and two and three and four and. So now I have a rest on beat one, so it's going to be it's going to be rest and two, three, and. So rest and two, three, rest, and. So three, rest, rest, and. Three, and, rest, and. Three, rest, rest, and. Three, and, four, and. Right, so if I'm performing it, ready, and one. Bop, 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 bop. So I'll click along with myself. Ta, 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 ta. And I'm thinking that subdivision. One and two, three and four and. One and two, three and four and. Let's say it together. One and two, three and four and. Okay? So that is subdividing at the eighth note level. All right? And you're going to uh, quickly combine these things right? 
sometimes it's going to be fairly simple. Okay, one. See, that quarter note takes up a whole beat. One, two, and three, and four, and. One, two, and, and four, and. One, two, and three, and four, and. Okay? Next time, we'll work on subdividing at the 16th note level. Dive, dive, even deeper to 16th notes, which is really where the fun is. Um, most of you are probably pretty good at, at intuitively reading some of these rhythms, um, but the, the key is feeling the subdivision, that you're accounting for every impulse, right? So the first, it started out easy because there were only four impulses, right? One, two, three, four. So that's pretty easy to follow. One, rest, three, rest. As the number of impulses change, it just gets a little more complicated. But then you start to see groups of notes as we learn syllables before we learn full words. These syllables soon start to add up as, as become words for you the more you practice. Just like key signatures soon become second nature. One and and. One and rest and. Okay, it becomes one event as opposed to counting each subdivision in your mind. So the more, the more you live under the sea in subdivisions, folks, uh, the easier this kind of thing gets. And you start to see these rhythms more regularly and it becomes a little bit more second nature. Um, so I'm going to try and find some, some practice for those of you who are motivated and have time, uh, particularly have time to do this kind of thing. There's tons of, uh, there's tons, tons of sight reading, rhythm reading resources out there. Um, I'm going to come back to the regular view here. Give me one second. Um, there's tons of resources out there, so I'm going to try to, uh, to find some things, but um, these weeks actually are quite busy and fly by, so um, forgive me, I'll get to it soon. I'm sorry there's a square on my face. That's this camera. Um, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, does anybody have a birthday? Let's sing happy birthday on scale degrees, and then we'll call it a day. <clears throat> Let me know if it's your birthday in the comments. So here we go. Happy birthday on scale degrees. So if this is one, then we are singing here for happy, which is five, one, seven, six, five. So let's sing it together. Five, five, six, five, one, seven, five, five, six, five, two, one. Five, 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 three, one, seven, six, four, four, three, one, two, one, uh, four, four, three, one, two, one. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me today. Uh, for this class. We'll see you back here next week. I sent out a poll to the choir to see if this is a, a good time for most people. I'm open to doing it at a different time, so please reply back to that Survey Monkey survey. If you'd rather me do this in the evening, if you think that more people could join us live at this time, that's totally cool. Uh, tonight we have Zoom happy hour at 7.30, I think, so check out the Zoom link. You can also call in. If there's a lot of people, I can split everybody up into different, uh, into different Zoom rooms. So we'll just hang a little bit, give everybody a chance to catch up. Um, if you've already Zoomed for hours and hours and hours, please don't feel obligated to join us. It's only for people who, uh, uh, who have do been doing nothing else but eating Cheetos and watching Tiger King uh, and need a little bit of human interaction. Please come and join us. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a great afternoon.